All the talking about two-state solution are quite nice when you are sitting in the Mayflower Hotel in Washington, but it has nothing to do with the Israeli public these days. You're listening to Inside Israel Today with Gil Hoffman on the Land of Israel Network. Hello and welcome to Inside Israel Today here on the Land of Israel Network at thelandofisrael.com. We're uh, here uh, the morning after the leader of the Israeli Labor Party, the leader of the Zionist Union faction in the Knesset, the leader of what has been called since the time of the peace process of the 1990s, the peace camp Avi Gabai, caused a political storm here by promising that as part of a peace agreement with the Palestinians, settlements would not have to be evacuated. Wait a second. We're not allowed to use the word settlements here in the Land of Israel Network. Communities in Judea and Samaria. Now, people have asked me, what, do you, what words do you use in the Jerusalem Post? I mean, communities in Judea and Samaria is quite uh, cumbersome. Uh, sometimes we do use settlements. Sometimes we use, God forbid, West Bank, even though it's not historically or geographically even correct, uh, just because that's the way people talk. Um, and sometimes we do use Judea and Samaria, and certainly we're giving the position of the government, the Israeli right, uh, perhaps a consensus of the people of Israel will, will use Judea and Samaria, whereas West Bank we'd be using when we're quoting someone on the left. But maybe that's changing, because we're seeing how the leaders of the supposed Israeli left, the supposed Israeli peace camp, sound the same way that uh, Naftali Bennett does on the right. It was a very big deal back in 2009 when Netanyahu said that settlements were not going to be evacuated. Um, he did it when he wanted to get more support on the right and um, nobody really believed him. And now you have the leader of the Israeli left saying it as well. Um, and that can't be underscored because uh, Avi Gabai is a smart man. He reads polls. He would not be saying something like this if he didn't intend to uh, implement it. He did backtrack it uh, a little bit overnight in uh, a WhatsApp that he sent to the members of Knesset within his party. Uh, but he didn't backtrack it the whole way. He's implying that perhaps more isolated communities in Judea and Samaria, should there be a peace agreement leading to a two-state solution, which has become less and less likely over time, obviously, uh, would remain. Remain where? Does that mean that we would have a uh, really truncated new Palestinian state with a lot of balloons in the middle of it? a balloon being the settlement itself being the balloon or the community and uh, the string being a road? Or is he implying that Jews would live under Palestinian control? If he implies the first, then he's very optimistic. And if he's implying the second, uh, then he's delusional. Israel will never allow a Jew to be under Palestinian control. Look, I was there in Gaza when we withdrew from Gush Katif. I was there wearing an IDF uniform, the spokesman's unit of the army. Don't hold it against me. Um, I was there explaining to the world what was going on. Okay, I didn't. I in journalism, you're supposed to answer who, what, when, where, and why. The first paragraph is supposed to say who, what, when, and where. The rest of the article is the why. In the spokesman's unit of the IDF, who, what, when, where. Period. You leave the why. For the politicians. The why is not for the army. And we saw that the, both the government and the army said no Jew will be left behind. No Jew will go, will live there, still there in Gaza under Palestinian control. A lot of them wanted to. They don't want to lose their home. They said, you know, we're strong. We'll defend ourselves. Um, no. That's not safe. It's illegal as an Israeli for me to enter Area A of the Palestinian Authority. 
I do so only with uh, Israeli politicians with a, an extensive uh, security detail, uh, fully coordinated with Palestinian security officials. Okay, There will not be a situation where Israelis, where a whole community would live in an Arab state, um, not on purpose anyway. And so perhaps Avi Gabai was speaking, you know, very theoretically. I don't know if even he believes he'll ever be the prime minister of Israel. But the significance of him making such a statement can't be denied. What this shows is that the enterprise of construction in Judea and Samaria was so successful that it won over not only the Israeli right that talks about it day in and day out, but the Israeli left that built most of those communities, but then felt embarrassed by those communities and saw them as a burden during the peace process and now is coming around again to endorse them wholeheartedly. We've seen how Avi Gabai, where was he on Tisha B'Av, mourning the destruction of Jerusalem's temples? He was in Efrat. Now, uh, those uh, American immigrants from New Jersey living in Efrat might not see themselves as living in a settlement, but technically they are. And so even though it might be a, a rather consensus place, the very fact that Avi Gabay was there was a big deal. Yair Lapid recently spoke at uh, what can only be called an, an outpost uh, in Gush Etzion. Um Isaac Herzog is very proud that one of the communities in Gush Etzion, Masuot Yitzchak, is named after his grandfather, just like he is. And so this is really a, a message to the world. This is not the time for the world to be putting pressure on Israel to evacuate settlements, to freeze construction in settlements. Uh, we're speaking on a day in, in which uh, a lot of construction is supposed to be announced by the Higher Planning Committee, Committee of Judea and Samaria. Um, probably there will be international condemnations. But why? Why, when we see that the leaders of the Israeli left say these places are going to be a part of Israel forever in any kind of agreement? Why, when we know that over the eight years of the Barack Obama administration, when there was a policy of not one brick to be built over the pre-67 border, and during those eight years of that policy, there was not one moment of a serious peace process. Within those eight years, there were only nine months when there was a peace process. Those were the nine months after John Kerry became the Secretary of State. And unlike Hillary Clinton, who, who didn't really succeed in pushing Obama around on the Middle East issue, John Kerry did. He came in and he said, as he had four years earlier to Obama, your idea of demanding not one brick is not helpful to there being a peace process. And this time uh, Obama led him, and he started a peace process that was predicated on Israel giving up a different concession to the Palestinians as, in, as a gesture. It was releasing murderers from prison, which wasn't a very uplifting demand that the Palestinians had. But the official policy of America during that time, at least behind the scenes, was that they would turn a blind eye to Israeli construction. Those were the only nine months during the Obama administration. If anyone wants a test of whether settlements are an obstacle to peace, look at those eight years. During the eight years minus nine months where the policy was not one brick, no peace process. During the nine months where the policy is do whatever you want, but don't brag about it, there was a peace process. And now with Donald Trump coming in and saying one thing and the opposite when it comes to this issue, he's trying to launch a peace process. And I don't think anyone in his government seriously believes that whether a Jew lives in one community or another or, or builds a home for his s children, whether that's really going to be the thing that stops the peace process from getting off the ground. Um, I think it's a very important message to the world to learn from. Now, what does Netanyahu think? Well, you know, that's something that we are still trying to figure out. He did say he wouldn't evacuate a single community. He reiterated again a few months ago. Should we believe him? No. <laughs> Under pressure, Netanyahu might do uh, a lot of different things. Uh, Netanyahu is certainly 
someone I, I wouldn't trust if I was living in Judea and Samaria and cared about my home. So, uh, look, the, the future is still very much in the air when it comes to uh, Judea and Samaria. Anything can still happen. But if I'm a settler, if I am a proud resident of Judea and Samaria, I would feel a lot more comfortable and a lot more safe today uh, with Avi Gabai as the leader of the Labour Party um, and with Donald Trump as President of the United States than I would have felt eight years ago with Barack Obama and everything he wanted to do. After the break, uh, we're going to uh, play a audio uh, recording of a colleague of mine. His name is Amit Segal. Amit Segal is the political correspondent and analyst at Channel 2, my counterpart. And he is easily the top journalist in Israel today. He has scoops every single night. And in Israel, Channel 2 is the media outlet uh, that dominates uh, the headlines. It has the highest rating, uh, and the news cycle in Israel really revolves around the news on Channel 2, and, and he's their top reporter. And so uh, every night he has information leaked to him by politicians that really sets the agenda. And uh, his, he, his uh, English isn't perfect, but it's certainly passing. The accent and the mistakes here and there make it more authentic. I, I, I told him after he said to me afterward, oh, I made so many mistakes and he felt embarrassed. And, uh, but I thought he did a really good job. And uh, I wanted to play for you the recording of how he saw the significance of this statement by Avi Gabai, which actually was made to his television station, to Channel 2 last night, starting this uproar. So stay with us after the break. Thank you. We believe and affirm that the Messiah will come, says the Rambam in the 12th of his 13 principles. If he delays, wait for him. He will surely come. Now, I wouldn't presume to know how this story ends, but I've been telling it since what I see to be the beginning. I'm Rob Mike Foyer, and this is The Jewish Story. Listen to The Jewish Story with Rav Mike Foyer on thelandofisrael.com. And we're back here on Inside Israel Today on the Land of Israel Network on thelandofisrael.com. We're, uh, we're devoting the latter part of our show today to a briefing given to foreign press by Amit Segal at the Jerusalem Press Club in Yamin Moshe Mishkin Ochan Anim, a beautiful neighborhood overlooking the old city walls in Jerusalem. Um, he gave this briefing on record, and unsurprisingly, the first question asked by Steve Lindy, the uh, editor-in-chief of the Jerusalem Report, the former editor-in-chief of the Jerusalem Post, and an all-around great guy on that. There's a consensus among everyone who has met him. Uh, the question that Steve asked was about the controversial statement that Avi Gabai made, the leader of the Labor Party, the leader of the Zionist Union, the leader of the Israeli left of what's called the peace camp, that if he is ever elected prime minister and reaches a peace agreement with the Palestinians, settlements would not have to be evacuated. I wanted you, uh, ladies and gentlemen, listeners, to hear uh, how Mr. Segal saw this groundbreaking statement by Avi Gabai. Here's the recording. What do you think of the latest comments uh, by Avi Gabai? Okay. Mm -hmm. in, in the past, being in the right wing meant that you oppose the two-state solution, and being in the left wing meant that you actually support, support it. it. But it changed because Benjamin Netanyahu, for instance, so publicly supports, repeatedly, repeatedly supports the two-state solution. He articulated it in a dramatic speech in Bar Ilan eight years ago. And everybody who knows Netanyahu personally understands how important it is for him. I mean, for Bibi saying, oh, it's just a politician, he just said it, is not 
something which is valid. Because for Benjamin Netanyahu, the revisionist wing, the ancestors of the Likud party, words of the most important ingredient, ingredient on earth, more important than bricks. The left in Israel believed in bricks, in buildings, in, 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 um, in uh, I, um, I don't know, in fields. The revisionist vision think or believes that words shape the world. That words actually make the world what it is. It's not a coincidence that Bibi sees the Balfour Declaration as the most, the, the most important event in the history of the modern Jewish people. Not the establishing the new villages in, in I don't know, in the, in the beginning of the 20th century. And for Bibi to say, to publicly articulate the term two-state solution is something dramatic. So how can it be that he's the leader of the, of the right wing? And on the other hand, that Avi Gabai says that settlements should not be evacuated even under a peace accord, and that his predecessor, um, Yitzhak Herzog said that the two-state solution is not feasible, and that Herzog's predecessor, Shalit Himovic, said that um, settlements are not the enemy of the left wing. How come? And I think that the solution, that the answer is, is, is as follows. Israel is massively supported a significant concessions to the Palestinians. Israelis believed in the 90s um, or the lion's share of the Israeli public supported the two-state solution when he thought, when the, public, the Israeli public believed it is feasible. Because Israelis really believed in the two-state solution, in the bilateral option. But the bilateral, bilateral option died in the year 2000, when Ehud Barak went to come. David, offered Yasser Arafat everything give or take, and got a big no in return. This is, at least, we will not get into fights about what happened in Camp David. I just tried to explain what the Israeli public believes in. Ehud Barak, for instance, um, believes that this, this is the reason why he's the most unpopular person in Israeli politics since two, the year 2000. Things changed dramatically, but only one thing remained from the beginning of the millennium. Ehud Barak's public support is equal to a cottage cheese, <laughs> <laughs> a dietary cottage cheese, three percent. And the reason is that the right wing never for, uh, will never forgive Barak for offering the Palestinians everything, and the left wing will never forgive Barak when it came out that it, it's not enough. When when when. We found out that it's not enough for achieving peace. So El Baran actually broke into pieces the dream about greater Israel of the right and the dream about a, a historical peace agreement in, in, in between Israel and Palestinians. So the bilateral option died in the year 2000. And then Israelis actually resorted to the other option, which is the unilateralism, the unilateral dis disengagement plan in the year 2005, from Gaza Strip, five years earlier from Lebanon. But the wars in Lebanon in 2011 and 2006, in Gaza in 2008, in 2012 and 2014, actually convinced the Israelis that the unilateral option is dead as well. So if bilateralism is dead and unilateralism is dead, so Israelis are I don't know how to call it, cautious pessimists. It's not that Israelis believe in the settlement movement as Bezalel Smotrich or Naftali Bennett would want to believe. No. I would say that, you know that the orange color was the color of the, opposed, the, of the opposition to the unilateral discussion plan for Gaza. So Israelis are orange color these days, but it's not the orange color of 
the settlements. It's the orange color of the death suits of ISIS victims. Israelis really think that these days, when the Middle East is in a, in a permanent turmoil, is not the smartest timing for major concessions. Because most chances that we will not get a Western democracy with the capital in Ramallah, but an Islamist terror um, entity led by extreme Islamists 20 kilometers from Tel Aviv. So I think as long as no other solution is found, the pessimist perspective will let Bibi or the cool the right wing to stay in office. But if another solution is found, I don't think it's a, uh, how would I say that? It's, it, it, Netanyahu's government can collapse in seconds, okay? And the reason Avi Gabay actually said what he said is because he, understood, he knows how to read polls. And he sees that the two, this, the, all the uh, talking about two-state solution are quite nice when you are to believe me, sitting in the Mayflower Hotel in Washington, but for, it, 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 it has nothing to do with the Israeli public these days. So what he tries to, to do is to, to actually say, I'm a, 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 I'm a, like a BB follow me option, okay, in terms of policy, in terms of the diplomatic arena and security. So now when we are all at the same boat in terms of pessimism regarding this, now you can vote if you're not a, a, an Israeli from the middle class, the median voter in Israel, you can vote for me because I'm not corrupt, because I'm the new guy neighborhood. This is the reason why Avi Gabay does that. You assume that Gabay said what he said because he, he actually saw the situation and he believes that the solution on the ground should be something different. But you have to bear in mind that Avi Gabay is first and foremost a politician. And the, the term settlement or settlers in the eyes of the Israeli left is the most thing, the most important thing, even more than peace with the Palestinians. There is a joke that says, you know the term that uh, the operation succeeded but the patient died? Mm -hmm. Okay? So after the disengagement plan, the joke in the right in the left was that the the um, operation failed but at least the patient died. I mean <laughs> the purpose was not making peace with the Palestinians of the disengagement, the disengagement plan. The disengagement plan, plan destroyed the prospects for moderate Palestinian camp. It actually gave a huge prize to Hamas. It proved each and every Palestinian that the only way to deal, to force Israel to evacuate settlements is by terrorist attacks. And Abu Maz and Abbas knew it, and even Sharon knew it. But what was the thing? It was getting rid of the settlers. Because what we see in Israel is a fight between two elites. The leftist elite, the secular Ashkenazi from Tel Aviv, and the ultra and the national religious Ashkenazi elite from the settlements. This is the thing. And th this is why when Herzog said that the two-state solution is not feasible, no one dared, right? He said it almost two years ago, no one cares. But when Ati Gabay says, I support in the two-state solution, but I don't think settlements should be evacuated, half of his faction actually rebelled. This is, this is the thing. Settl settler, se settlements and the question of settlements is not something we discuss with the Palestinians. It's something we discuss inside Israeli society. And this is the importance of what Ati Gabay said. And it emanates from the fact that he's a politician that once seeks to attract voters from the soft right wing to tell them, I don't hate you. Here, I can find a solution which will form peace without the need of, I don't know, with, with, with the fostering hate in, in, in the Israeli society. 
This is what I try to say. As for solutions, I, I believe, I, I totally agree with, with, with what you said. Uh, if you see, Ziphi Lidli offered a solution that will enable settlers in, in, in three years ago, during the talks with Kerry and, uh, and uh, Arika, that would enable uh, settlers to, to, to stay under Palestinian uh, uh, control. Bibi repeatedly says that he will never evacuate settlements, thus implying that they will have to stay within the borders of the Palestinian state. There is the balloon theory of, you know, a balloon with a stick, the, the stick is the road to Israel, and the balloon is the settlement that actually will connect all the settlements to Israel. There are many options and, and many solutions, but uh, they're all theoretical. That was Amit Segal, the top scoopster in Israeli media, the chief political correspondent and analyst of Channel 2, and my counterpart over there, giving his interesting answers at the Jerusalem Press Club to the foreign press here in Jerusalem today. Thank you for being with us here on Inside Israel today, on the Land of Israel Network, on thelandofisrael.com. Um, on a personal note, uh, this is my last show before I go off on vacation. I'm going to be the, over the next three weeks in Chicago, the best city in America, and then Philadelphia, New York, New Jersey, Charleston, South Carolina, up and down South Florida, back to New York, New Jersey, Dallas, Texas, Seattle, and then concluding in Honolulu, Hawaii. If uh, you want any information on attending talks, then uh, you can email me at gill at jpost.com or follow me on Twitter at gill underscore Hoffman, where I'm sure I'll be updating people on where I am. Uh, you're certainly invited to come to the culmination of that trip on Sunday, November 5th at Temple Emmanuel in Hawaii, where I will be delivering a lecture in my 50th state out of the 50. And yes, don't worry, I've also spoken in Puerto Rico just in case it ever becomes a state. And I, I don't think anybody else has ever done that before, speaking about Israel in all 50 states. So I'm very thankful to God and to all those my, who uh, have helped me in achieving that goal. We'll see uh, whether I'll be succeeding in recording shows from America. I hope to. It's been a pleasure here on Inside Israel Today. Thank you. Bye-bye. Who are we as a people? Who are we as a nation? What does it mean to be a Jew in the land of Israel, as a Jew in Judea? What is our message to the world? We're finally back in our land, and we get to ask these questions. Ezrat Hashem, we're going to make Judea and Samaria an issue for the entire world to know that the Jews have a place in the world. Israel Inspired with Ari Abramowitz and Jeremy Gimpel on the Land of Israel Network at thelandofisrael.com.